Um, and then we will uh, continue with the final part of our conference, the final part of today, which is the workshop on uh, bear nutrition. And um, this workshop is organized by uh, Dr. Charles Robbins and Professor Marcus Klaus. And it will reveal different feeding regimes of bears and adaptations towards their environments. Uh, many of you have sent in their bear diets, um, maybe too many, huh, Marcus? <laughs> uh, so that will lead uh, to suggestions how uh, zoo feeding regimes can mimic conditions in, uh, in natural habits of bears. In bears. Um, Dr. Charles Robbins is a professor at Washington, Washington State University who has studied the nutrition of wild animals for 40, 50, sorry, even longer, 51 years and founded and directed a captive and wild brown bear research program for over 35 years. In his talk, he will introduce you to their studies that have led to basic understanding of the diets of wild brown bears and polar bears which now form the basis of a um, new applied concept for creating healthy diets for the managed care of polar bears and brown bears. Marcus Klaus is the head of research at the Clinic, Zoo, uh, Clinic for Zoo Animals, Exotic Pets and Wildlife of the Vet Swiss faculty of the University of Zurich in, uh, in Switzerland. He has been a very active member of the European Zoo Nutrition Group for more than a decade. And for many of us, he's a huge inspiration in our daily work, mainly because of his work on, on herbivores. And after a day, after today, I'm sure we can add uh, bear nutrition to that list as well. So please, Marcus, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Anouk, for introducing us. Before I start sharing my screen, I need to grab this from my shelf. I'm not sure how many of you know this of the young people. Oh, it's difficult to see this is a book wildlife feeding and nutrition and it came out in i'm not saying when i was 13 years old when it came out the first edition and the second edition 10 years later with substantial substantial additions to it is an absolute classic and those young people who might not have been born when the books came out you should know about them and you should get the second edition because it's really a good thing and of course this is written by Charles Robbins. And Charles Robbins is not only famous for that book, but mainly, I would say, for his work on bears. So we were extremely, extremely happy that he would join us for this um, last part of the conference. So now I'm going to start sharing my screen. And the first thing will be an introductory session. So this is Charles and me giving you a session of about two hours. First, we will talk about some general issues where I do some short things on bears, what species they are, how they are perceived. And then there will be the core session, half an hour of this first part, which will be Charlie's lecture on his new insights on nutrition of polar bears and brown bears. We'll do a Q&A se session on that and a five minute break. And then comes the second part, what I called and um, what makes bear super special. So. First, we're going to cover more or less the following bear species. So we have the closely related brown bear and polar bear, a little bit less related, the two black bear species. And then we have the um, um, sun bear and then the sloth bear and the spectacle bear. Spectacle bear already, so to speak, halfway between these groups of bears and the panda. We're not going to talk about the smaller things. So even though the panda is very well known, we're not going to touch on it a lot. You have then coming from the different direction, the spectacle bear, you have the sloth bear who's well known under in zoo vets for special conditions he has, the sun bear, the two black bears, the Asian one and the American one. And then of course, the charismatic brown bear and the polar bear. When we think about how bears are perceived. I have, well, one of my missions is there's so many strange names that are used in our profession. And one of the things I want to briefly question is, what does it mean if people say something is an omnivore? It's even like people have these names in their heads like omnivore and they think this is like an explanation. So you mention a species and they say, oh, it's an omnivore, as if that meant something. Um, there was, a paper not on bears, but you can see here on boars. So it's this species. Um, 
where they talked about the natural diet of wild boars. And of course, what you would expect in the abstract, they say the wild boar is an omnivore. And then they do the review and they come to the conclusion that about 90% of the diet eaten by this omnivore is plant material. So you could ask, well, if 90% plant material is an omnivore, what would be a herbivore? Um, these words like omnivore for me have the tendency to make us think, you know, they're like the garbage eaters. They eat everything or anything. And by using this term omnivore, we somehow lose the respect for a species because we think, you know, actually what we feed doesn't really matter because they eat everything. So very briefly, let's talk about the natural diets. And when you are wondering about natural diets of something, one of the Mm, frustrating things in our profession is there's no one source where you can look up all the diets of all species. Well, actually, you know, there is, for example, there's this, what is called a data paper in the journal Ecology. It's called Elton Traits because Elton is one of the people who defined how niches are actually defined. And on the supplementary material, you get a huge Excel file where for all the mammals that they are, so you can see they start with the echidna here and the platypus, you have the proportions of the natural diet in terms of endotherm, ectotherm, prey, fish prey, etc. And this is evidently quite crude because this is not a super detailed review for each species. But if we use this, and we're using their categories that you can see down here. And we make plots for these for the different bears. So the panda would be nearly completely a herbivore with seems like the sources they use some occasional vertebrates in there. On the other side, you have the polar bear as a complete predator that has also a certain percentage of fish. And then you have the other species like brown bears, for example, in the data collection, there's a huge area covered, huge percentage by plants. And this is why I used this picture that Charles gave me kindly as a background as well, because we usually tend to forget that a species like the brown bear might eat a lot of green material. And you have on the other side, the spectacled bear considered a real fruit eater. You have the black bears that are like considered mixtures between fruit eaters and insect eaters also have plant material in there. And the sun bear and the sloth bear would be the two that have the highest proportion of insects in their diet, especially the sloth bear is considered a ant specialist, so to say. You know that these, class, um, these diets that I took from that publication are not completely correct. Like everybody knows brown bear, at least some of them, they consume a lot of salmon and somehow in that data set, there's no fish in there. And People know that the black bears in the Rocky Mountains, sometimes they have this period when they turn over the stones and get out the beetle larvae, so they also eat insectivores. Not everything is in there. When you think about the diets that these species have, there's a lot of variation, for example, between populations. And this is from one study where you can see already something like a rule for the brown bear that as you go towards the north, the proportion of meat that they have in their diet, that a mammal prey actually increases and the, the relevance of fruit decreases. That was actually put into pictures like here that for the springtime, you see the Northern Scandinavian brown bears are much more in the color of the animal food than the middle European ones. But even when you go for autumn, all of them use plant food as a majority. You have huge variation between years, like years of high or low berry production. You have within populations, you have differences between individuals because some animals might more go for the garbage dumps, might more go for anthropogenic food. Others might more go to the streets or to the railway tracks and others might not like to do this. So some bears in the winter and the autumn time become more fed eating more prey animals. Some get more fed by eating more berries. So there is variation within the species. We need to talk very briefly about the digestive physiology in a very crude way. And you know that I'm usually obsessed with animals that have fermentation chambers, like the foregut fermenters, 
like the hindgut fermenters. And our usual message, message is that you don't want to disturb the microbiome in there. Don't put food that mainly contains sugar in those systems. And like everybody, I hope, knows these nice um, posters that Chaling Hausmann made for zoo commissaries. And this warning is not only for the hoof stock, this warning also applies for the primates, where we say, please get rid of fruits in their diets. Now, looking at the digestive tract of bears, however, they're extremely simple. As you can see, these two from the paper of Amanda McGrosky, you don't even have a cecum. So if you have the digestive tract, you can't really tell where's the small intestine, where's the large intestine. It's just one simple tube. And this is the same for the black bear as well. And even the highly specialized herbivore bear, the panda, doesn't show any digestive tract specialization for plant diet. So what happens if you put high sugar items in these digestive tracts? Well, they're not really disturbing anything because there's no microbial fermentation chamber. They just make the owner of these guts fat. And with bears, you might want them to become fat at certain times in the year. We'll come to that later. A lot of the data that was generated on the digestive physiology very evidently was generated by Charles and his group. And so if my name is down there, it's just because I collected that for a lot of carnivores, but all the bear data points come from Charles' work. And there is a simple rule that as fiber increases in the diet, the digestibility of the diet goes down in bears as in other carnivores. If you compare the fat content of the diet and the digestible fat in the same diet, you can see that the bears are not different from all the other carnivores that exist. And that also goes for the protein digestibility. So in terms of how the digestibility of fats and proteins and even fiber works, bears are not that different. However, just because they are not different in how they digest the stuff doesn't mean they have the same requirements like dogs or cats. It's just the mechanism that happens during absorption that's quite similar. So now I'm already nearly there to hand over to Charles. I just wanted, when going through these natural diets, I noticed something that I find a little bit interesting. Because with the brown bears or with the black bears, you get these photos where they're eating these equis eating, these horse tails, which is typically a diet most normal herbivores avoid because they have thiaminases in there. You know that you should not feed this to horses. And these equisitum are also known because they have a very high silica, very high abrasive content. Um, I remember my wife saying that her grandmother actually used those for scrubbing um, pans from the kitchen when they didn't have like um, metal scrunch scrubbers or so. And this is similar to what the panda does, specializing on a grass bamboo that has extremely high silica contents. And maybe one of the advantages bears have over other herbivores, they usually only have disadvantages, we don't, they, they don't ferment, etc. They have these teeth com covered completely in enamel so that foods with very high silica content like bamboo or like horse tails cannot damage them as much as they would damage teeth whose occlusive surface is composed of animal and dentin to make this um, razor surface. Now, end of my five minute stopwatch. Um, and this is the second part of the Bayer Nutrition Workshop. I want to mention at the beginning that I relied on the help of Luis Martin, our resident, for typing in some of the data I was sent, and on Marco Rolle, a friend and vet at the Zoological Garden of Karlsruhe, for doing some evaluations that you're going to see. And I want to take, take away this stigma of being the dump garbage omnivore and make hammer home the message that bears are super special because they are specialists, specialists for seasonality and specialists for small food items. And when it comes to being a seasonality specialist, the easiest way to see that is if you look at the birth records. So you have two years in a row here, and that's the proportion of all births that occur in zoological gardens. 
And you know that polar bears give birth in winter, and that's what the brown bears do as well. That's what the American and the Asian black bears do. But even a species like the sloth bear does that, even though it's not really from a temperate environment. And the spectacled bear does that as well. Even the panda, though at another time of year, is relatively seasonal. The only bear that's not like that would be the sun bear. And evidently, it's not us realizing this for the first time, but there's been papers on this. And they actually suggest that the fact that things like the sloth bear or the spectacled bear show this seasonality, even though they don't live at high latitude um, environments, shows that they evolved a seasonality and that they might have shifted to different habitats more recently. So seasonality is quite specifically inborn in bears. Another example why they are so special is the size of their neonates. So if you compare body masses of a lot of different mammals for their neonate mass, you see this normal relationship. This is a log-log plot. And you know that marsupials, they produce, give birth to very, very tiny neonates, the joeys, because they then develop further in the pouch. If you plot bears to a relationship like that, they are, they have quite small neonates for their own adult body mass. If you would have a closer look, this is like a polar bear being magnitudes lower than other similar sized mammals. And the same for the brown bear, for example, and the panda, the most extreme ones of the bears. And if you try to find pictures that actually show this, you might have a small sun bear kitten and it looks really cute compared to the mother, but that must be already several days old. Like you have this picture of a polar bear and that looks like quite a new neonate and it's tiny pictures of brown bear neonates. I mean, this is amazing. If I would not have known or read about this, I would not, I would doubt whether this is the same species or not. And I guess every one of you has seen these pictures of baby pandas that actually look like aliens from the movie Alien and have no resemblance to the adult animal. Why is this? There's a very smart explanation in this paper from 1986, and I'm breaking it down in other kind of text here. And that is, embryos in the uterus, they cannot use fatty acids, they need glucose, but a mother that is not eating, that is fasting, she cannot make glucose from burning down her fat reserves. She, she has to catabolize body protein to produce glucose. However, once the animal is born, a neonate can use fatty acids, and then a mother that burns down her fat stores, can put the fatty acids in the milk and can feed it. So having very, very tiny neonates seems to be an adaptation that saves the mother from burning down her body protein to make the young one grow in utero. So the fact that all the bears have these small neonates is a proof of the evolutionary history of them being adapted to these periods where the mothers den and use only body fat for the final stages of pregnancy and the first stages of lactation. And that's something to keep in mind. So for bears, obesity is something that they want at certain stages of their lives and of the yearly cycle. Evidently, when you talk about seasonality, you can track that down in seasonal diet shifts. And there's a lot of literature on this. Like, for example, you could look at it this way, that this is for brown bears. You have the meat part, the prey part of the diet that increases in spring and goes down. You have the green part, like Charles mentioned, the clover, the forbs that are higher a little bit later towards the summer and then go down. And then in the autumn, you have especially the fruit parts that goes down. So different kinds of foods at different, different kinds of foods at different times of year. There's this way of putting this into these kind of graphs. You will see that again and again when you look at the bear literature, there's always one name popping up. And you would read this like, for example, in this population, you have this increase in the use of green vegetation towards the summer. And then towards the autumn, it's these berries that are used that don't exist evidently in spring. And when you look at a lot of these patterns like I just taped 
type down data from a lot of different um, studies on brown bears. It looks like visually you always have the same thing that you have this peak in green at the beginning and then it becomes, this is the color of fruit that we have here towards the autumn. And you have different, you have different populations that do it a little bit differently, but the overall shift from green to yellow seems to be there. When you compare that to diets that were sent in, by the way, we had 16 diets for brown bears that were sent in and 12 of those had a seasonal component and, didn't, um, and nine of those had more than two seasonal components. For, so for this slide, I only used these nine. Then trying to type this down, actually, Louise helped me with this and the evaluation was evidently quick and dirty. But it, some of those diets, even though you had different diets sent in for summer and winter, they didn't, didn't look that much different depending on the season. This is on a dry matter basis. But some of the diets actually seem to have like an indication of this peak of vegetables and then going more for high energy, in this case, meat and fish and not fruit, or another diet where you increase the fruit in the autumn quite a lot. Going for polar bears, you don't have reports of seasonal diet variation that goes beyond different prey vertebrates. So the seasonal plot would look really similar, but three diets that were sent in actually had a seasonal component. One added actually the fat that Charles was talking about. And again, you would see, for example, that in summer, the reliance on commercial diets, this is the black ones, and the vegetables was a bit higher and you had more meat and fish in the beginning and the end of the year. But again, the variation did not seem to be very, very high. In black bears, again, this is from wild data for Americans, you see the same pattern as for the brown bears. Green in the spring towards the summertime and then the fruit color takes over. Some, spe some populations, the insects come in as well. But it's again this shift. The only diet that came in had a nominal seasonal component, but if you look at the distribution of vegetables and fruits, that did not reflect the shift that you would have in natural populations. For Asian black bears, you might think these are the same graphs, but they're all different graphs from all the different publications. Again, in Asian black bears, you have this same pattern that they start off with more using plant diets, going more to the fruits. Sometimes there's an insect component there, but it's always this shift across the season. And one diet that was sent in had a nominal component in there, but if you look at it, plot it in a similar way, you, it doesn't look like there's a strong seasonal component in there. So for the sun bears, there's nothing published on them that you could use to evaluate whether they have seasonal diet shifts. The two diets that were sent in look like this. So one diet that one of you feeds was um, heavily relying on a commercial product added with some vegetables and fruits. And another diet was mainly dominated by fruits and honey and some vegetables and some meat there. If you go for sloth bears, there's actually, again, a lot of publications where you can make these plots. These are all natural populations where you have this difference in the diets that they ingest, depending on whether you have the fruiting season or the non-fruiting season, where they shift heavily towards the use of insects. The only diet that I received with a seasonal component for sloth bears looked a little bit like this, that the main difference was made by using nuts, that's the yellow part, fruits, some insects, and reducing the meat and the commercial diet that was given there. But still doesn't really look like this. So the visual impression is that a lot of the diets that I received don't really seem to follow the same shift that you see in the natural diets if you do such a quick and dirty comparison. But don't despair, they will come, the diets are not so bad as this might make it seem. Spectacle bears, you don't have any literature that would allow you to make these plots for wild populations. Um, I received five diets and only one of them had the nominal seasonal component where you can actually see that there was a shift towards the winter with having more fruits in there and a reduction of the commercial um, of the pelleted component. And you had these four different 
so to speak, static non-seasonal diets where um, at least in three of them, um, the commercial diet was making a, a big contribution to them. When you're thinking about bears being seasonality specialists, you have to realize that the body mass of the bears is not constant. We are all used to pictures like this, where you would have a thin polar bear at some time of the year and a better looking animal. Actually, for, um, sorry, for polar bears, you have body condition scores that are published that you could use to track the state of the bear. And you would expect them to show variation from one stage to the other in a seasonal rhythm. If you go to the internet, you can actually find a lot of pictures that look like this for brown bears. And they always work like this. You have the same individual in June 29 and in September, like it's a few months later, it's the same specimen and see the change in the body condition that they show in the wild. There are several pictures like that where you always have people identify the same individuals and they link that body condition. And you should not think it's always in this direction from thin to fat. This somehow appeals to our intuition. That, yeah, they're growing somehow. It's also the other way. Before hibernation, they're fat. After hibernation, they're really thin. And I found this one individual that seems to have a little bit of fame in the bear hall of fame because it is photographed so often, um, this animal called Otis, where you have again this picture of a thin animal in July and a very obese animal in the end of October. And this is 2010. And then there's another set of pictures of the same individual four years later, again in July, when the animal starts out relatively thin. But in a very short period of time, it puts on weight. This is still the middle of July. And then in September, the animal really puts it on. And the interesting thing is these photos are more or less taken from the same spot. So it seems like the animal is just staying on the same spot trying to get fat. So what you have to realize here, it's not a one way direction, but these animals are thin, getting obese, lose weight, get obese, lose weight, get obese on a regular basis. This is what you want to see in a seasonality specialist. To what degree the same occurs in other species is not so easy to tell in nature because the documentation is not so good. I found for the sun bears pictures in a season where there was a, fr um, a fruit shortage. And then you have pictures from zoos where you have obese animals, so they can become lean or fat. But there's nothing to link to wild population to say that they actually do this. But when you're thinking about this, this body mass gain and loss, you must think about the weight management that you want to do in your zoo. And you have to ask yourself, if you keep a seasonality specialist, how are you going to manage him without weighing? You need scales. You need some kind of regular monitoring for an animal for for which it is natural to be constantly fluctuating in this way. So you can take data from the wild. So this would be a publication that actually models the body mass gain and loss in brown bears. And let's just collect wildly something from the literature on wild populations. So you can see every summer and winter, there's this fluctuation. This would be data on pre and post hibernation body masses in males and females of brown bears. You have another publication that does the same for females and relates that to the number of cups that they're having. So a female that um, has cups might lose a bit more weight. You have data from Jennifer Watts nicely sending this in for male bears that she monitored over several years in her zoo. And you can see this fluctuation, that's the common topic. For polar bears, you have the pre and post hibernation. So it's a body mass loss there. And again, Jennifer also sent data for a male that she, actually, I think this is the Hudson that Charles also had in his talk that is monitored for quite a while. So you see these fluctuations all the time. It's been done for free ranging American black bears that you have this body mass loss after the hibernation and a captive population of Asian black bears, where you can also see this distinct decrease in body mass during hibernation. And at Zurich Zoo, because of regular weighing, we also have 
documentation of this fluctuation in spectacle players, not related to hibernation, but you see the fluctuation nevertheless. So if you want to get somewhat down to numbers, you can go to all these data and calculate what is the body mass loss um, during the hibernation or the dormant, the low period. And if you do this for the different data, you get a picture like that. So you could say, yeah, you know, at least 20%, 20% that's somehow in all of these data sets. So if I would say, if you have those kind of bears for which you know that they have a strong seasonal component, they're seasonality specialists, you want to have something like a 20% body mass loss at some stage. This would mean that if you have an animal that's 300 kilos at some stage, it's completely okay if it has 240 kilos at another stage. That might actually be the target that you want to go. But how are you going to do this without having the opportunity to weigh the animals? And imagine what happens with, your, with all your staff, with the personnel, if an animal loses five kilos. Is this ringing an alarm bell? And you see, even if you go for relatively small bears, the 20% would allow you for a 100 kilo bear go to 80 kilos. That should be considered a normal thing. In order to control that, you have to monitor. But this is what you want to achieve, I think. What would it be with the other bears, which we haven't, don't have this data for, or I didn't find it? I would say at least for those two that also have a clear birth seasonality, you would expect something like this. I cannot say that I recommend that you have them change in their body mass by 20%, but I would strongly suggest that you look in there. And evidently, if you want to have changes in body mass, this also means that you have to think about the amount of food that is actually offered. And this is where we go back to the diets that you sent in. So I said that in some of the diets, maybe if you look at this pattern, this is on a dry matter basis. The composition doesn't seem to be so exciting or here for a long time it seems to be relatively stable. You have some that have this change in diet composition with increasing fruit towards the autumn or increasing the fish and the meat towards the autumn or here increasing the nut component towards the autumn. Well you didn't only send in percent composition data but you sent in actually amounts and all this was done relatively quick and dirty. When we express the amounts that you have for those diets on a as fed basis in this case, you can see that there's much more seasonality in them than the previous picture would suggest. So you have in a lot of these diet sheets that you sent in, you have peaks and nadirs, or I mean, look at this very detailed documentation where you have always a period where more is fed and they had periods where less is fed. There might be differences depending on your zoo, your history, what some people think is the summer or the autumn diet. And we didn't have dates and I'm not saying that there is a special point where this should be shifted to here or this should be a little bit later. The point is there is change in most of these diets. Some of them seem to be quite monotonous, but a lot of them show these curves. And that is, I think, something that is important to keep in mind. Charles already said that in the chat already, you adjust or you change the amount of food that you give to your bears on a regular day, on a regular basis across the year. So looking at some of the diets for the other bears, this would be the brown bear diet. So the polar bear diets where I said, okay, like doesn't look like much seasonality. If you look at the original amounts fed, at least you could even see here that there is a peak where more is fed and then it's again less. You do the same for the black bear diet that I received and you see a clear difference in the amount that was fed or is on the diet sheet for that animal. So actually people are doing this. People are using the amounts to somehow reflect the seasonality of the species. For the Asian diet that I received, you have this peak here. It's not so distinct, 
I'm sorry, I have to stop this telephone from ringing. Chuck. And for the for the sloth sloth bear diet that we got, you have also there. Even though we don't have knowledge about the body mass fluctuations on sloth bear in the wild, you have here in the captive diet data a nice fluctuation. And for the spectacled bear, you have a similar thing. You might wonder why for the spectacled bear diet that we received, you have the summer and winter seemingly switched around. But actually, this is the same that we also found in data that we had on the bears in Zurich Zoo that comes, they lose body mass and they have a lower intake across the summer towards the winter. And then in winter, they start gaining body mass, so to speak, a little bit different from the seasonality that you have in the other species. Whether you would call it an inverse rhythm or not, it doesn't matter. But it, again, a species with a seasonal reproduction, small neonate, and you also have this seasonality in food provision. So if we try to make this into a concept, then you would say, okay, if I want to make a bear diet and I want to really replicate what is happening in the wild, the first I might think about the composition of the diet and I am putting the species that this might refer to on this part. And I say, okay, if I want to re somehow rebuild this a lot of greens at the beginning, more fruits in the end, then I might actually try to have a composition that looks like this, more greens, greens and vegetables in the beginning, more fruits. This might also mean more nuts towards the autumn. In Europe, we have this tradition of not relying on too much commercial food, but always having a certain proportion of it in there so that we are safe when it comes to minerals and vitamins. You might, I put this, this, this disclaimer down here. I'm not saying that these proportions are ideal. I'm just talking about the general pattern that you might see. You could try to replicate the fact that some of these animals like the brown bear, for example, has easier access to prey in the European setting, for example, in the springtime. You might consider if you have um, individuals that come from or that reflect populations that have more access to salmon, for example, to increase a little bit more fish in there. But the point is that in terms of the diet composition, you want to have this fattening period without the protein overload. This is what Charles talked about. You want to get them fat without having too much protein. So that means they need starch, they need fat, they need sugar to achieve that. And your pelleted protein, pellet should not have a protein content that's above 20%. Now, because we have in the bears also the predator, the polar bear, you could say maybe here we go for a little bit of a different strategy in terms of diet composition. You don't want to go so heavy on the fruits and the vegetable parts. And for the fattening period, you might want to add this fat specifically that Charles also showed these very nice photographs about. But again, it's a fattening without a protein overload. Now, when you're talking about using commercial diets, very evidently, you might think of using different ones depending on the season. I want to make a brief note that of all the diets that we received, we had 28 dry commercial diets that were part of the diet plans. And the average percentage of crude protein of all these dry feeds, most of them were dry dog foods, was 22.5%. So it would be in a range that would be what somehow what Charles Alls already recommended. So a lot of these commercial foods that were used in the diets that I received, they were not alarmingly high in terms of the protein that they had. But you could evidently play around with different pelleted diets. And there was one question that I received is, why are some people feeding um, monkey pellets to their bears? Why are they not using bear pellets? And there's this important thing. Don't believe in the names that are put on diets or 
only do this if you have a provider in which you have real good trust because there's nothing in terms of legal um, precautions that prevents me from selling something and calling it a hippopotamus diet. I don't have to prove to anyone that this is really for hippopotamus. So something that is called a monkey diet might in terms of nutrient composition evidently exactly match what you want. Don't go for the label name, go for the nutrient composition, go for the ingredients. So just intuitively, you might think if you want your pelleted or extruded commercial diet to reflect this seasonal shift, you might start with a dog pellet that is more a little bit like the meat component that some brown bear populations might have in the spring. You might go for a leaf eater primate diet in summer when the animals are relying more on green vegetation. And you might even go for something like a pig fattening diet in autumn when you want the animals to put on the lard, the fat. And you could say maybe for polar bears, you would use like a normal dog pellet that is low in protein, like 20%, and you might go for a higher fat pellet later. If you want to have the seasonal composition change in your diet item choices as well. Evidently, you can also just adjust the amounts and never change the composition of the diet. It may be a matter of how much challenge you want to have. So evidently, you increase and decrease the amount per season. So the picture would actually then look like this. And you could say, yeah, I don't want these changes in the proportions. I just want the changes in the amount. You could say, you know, it's really professional to do both the changes in the proportion and the amounts, it might be up to you. Evidently, it's more important to change the amounts than changing the composition. As long as the composition is never in areas where it's dangerous, like um, what Charles mentioned. So what you see here also is something that you might want to limit the amount at some stage. By the way, all this is fictitious amount. I'm not saying that this is what you should be feeding to a brown bear. We got a lot of questions of what, what are the amounts of foods that we should feed to our bears? And I would say, this depends so much on the subspecies that you have on your individual. You have to tailor the amount to your individuals. We can't give serious recommendations here, but weighing the animals and knowing their body size actually is a big bonus when you want to address the amounts that you're giving them. But you see, it might be that at some stage, you only give very, very little. And this might be because you want the animal to finally go into hibernation. And the question that you might have, well, is this something you do for all kinds of species? And I would say, well, if you have those species that are really hibernators, the ones that are here, this might be a good way to do it, to actually reduce the food more or less completely at some stage. If you have the species that are not going into hibernation, you might want to have this fluctuation a little bit less distinct. Nevertheless, you might want to have that because the species show the birth seasonality. They have neonates that are so small. They are somehow adapted to putting on fat and losing it. You might want to make them gain fat and lose that as well. By the way, this is the one time that I want to mention, we put it in the chat already. When you're doing polar bear bites, think of the vitamin A. There's no data on real requirements to my knowledge, but there's so many reports that show a positive effect when zoos supplemented vitamin A to polar bear diets. I think you should at least go for the maximum that you are allowed to feed to dogs and cats. Now, some of the questions that we received were in the area of, how do I get bears to eat something that is not so attractive, like greens and vegetables? And how do I get the bears to hibernate? In five minutes, Charles, I'm going to hand over to you for a brief spell. So evidently, what you would want to say is you can get a bear to eat anything, but you have to be strict. Now, this is easy to say. I tried to find something on this in the literature, and there's this paper that explains what happened to bears, grizzly bears in Yellowstone, when they shut, they didn't want them to use the garbage grounds anymore. So what happened is they 
prevented the bears of having access to the garbage points. And I made the important part here colorful that the main difference in the resource use after this closure period was the bears used more forbs. So it would be the greens, the thing that you think you have difficulty convincing your bear that it's good for him. Well, if there's nothing else, the animal will go for it. But come to that end point, thinking about hibernation. There is a nice study that has this wonderful title, Denning Behavior, um, Winter Sleep with Room Service, where they find that the time that the bears are in hibernation actually relates to latitude. So higher latitude, eventually there's longer winters, you have the longer denning period, but they had this one exception that was in a population in Alaska, where the authors explained that this has an exceptionally high supply of salmon. So there's food available for longer than for your average bear population. And this was a study done in Slovenia. And they also found that in their population, the bears were hibernating for a much shorter period of time because this is a heavily supplemented sub population. You can see these feeders here by which the bears are supplemented. So you could say, making the conclusion here that, yeah, maybe what you have to do is you have to be strict. Either you feed nothing else than your greens and vegetables, just ensure that there's a fattening period in sync with the season, but then when it's time for the greens and vegetables, don't feed anything else. You want this to be in sync with the cycle. So evidently it's a very bad idea to think oh, this September, let's start switching our bears from fruit to vegetables. That's not the time in the year to do it. Do it somewhere in the spring, and it should, in theory, work. And for the hibernation, evidently, it would be something, yeah, stop feeding them. This may be, Charles told that to me, this may be harder for the humans to do, actually, than for the bears to tolerate it. And I liked when Tamsin had her talk at the very start of the conference that she actually used a bear photograph as an example here that the acceptance of keepers to actually do these kind of things might be difficult to achieve it's easy to get an animal fat but to get to the other point where you say and now we will lose we have our specimen depending on how large it is lose 50 kilograms that's happening now that is the tough part and i was reminded of this book that changes basically the life of every parent. I'm an older parent now. It's called Every Child Can Learn to Sleep. I don't know whether those of you who have children know this. This can be a game changer if you have problems of getting your kids to sleep. Basically, all it tells you, you have to be really strict and get strict sleep time so that when your kid knows now it's sleep time, it can cry if it wants, but you won't come and um, talk to it again because it's sleep time and after a few days it gets used to that rhythm and the majority of that book is not dedicated to the fact that you have to be strict the majority of the book is dedicated to the problem between mama and papa between how can we stand this situation where the child is crying and i want to help no i want oh you're so hard you're such a hard-hearted person, you don't go there. It's about the problems we have in getting the child to the rhythm. And I would suggest, well, maybe Charles could say something like, every bear can hibernate. It's just a matter of how you do it. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to upload the last session of the workshop while Charles is telling his experience about getting bears to hibernate. I'm going to steal the screen away from Charles again, and okay. you can continue chatting with him, I think, because you've already done that, I think. And I want to, in the last 20 minutes to touch on a few more points in the bears. And one thing that I find peculiar about a member of the group carnivora, of the carnivores, that is so big as the bears are, is that they are actually specialists for quite small food items. Um, this is implicit in two wonderful 
papers that Charles put out. They are called Constraints on Frugivory by Bears and Constraints on Herbivory by Grizzly Bears. And what you see, what is implicit when you read them is that, yes, these bears are taking items that are relatively small, berries. They get fed on berries. They are huge, but they get fed on tiny material. And even those that are fattening themselves on salmon, it's still compared to what a similar sized cat, like a lion would take, it's still quite small prey items. So bears are used to, lots of them use small things. Now, I'm gonna do something that Tamsin said one should not do. I'm not gonna minimize confrontation for the next five minutes. And I'm gonna put a lot of um, value used communication in those next slides. There's something that is extremely dear to me personally. And this has to do with the euf euphemisms we use. Like this is like a George Carlin number where he says that you, we had a condition we used used to call shell shock, but now we call it combat fatigue because it doesn't sound so dramatic. Um, you all know the example that we used to say global warming, but now everybody's talking about climate change because that sounds a little bit, change is a positive thing. Yeah? Or we know that pornography, we call it adult content or prisons are used correctional facilities. And I think in the zoo business, we have one euphemism that is just as bad. At least that's my opinion. And I wanna confront you all with this value-based statement. There's something that is standard decency, how you should treat an animal, decent, standard. And you know how we call it? We call it enrichment. And I think this gives a wrong message. I would say frequent scatter feeding for an animal that feeds on very tiny material and that has to collect that throughout the day. Frequent scatter feeding is not enrichment. In my view, lump feeding in one to two meals, that's pauperization. That's how I would see it. Enrichment is how you would, what we call enrichment, but this means you're actually treating the species as is natural for it. And of course, having scatter feeding and lots of feeding is something that might become might be quite labor intensive and is not easy for people to do. There are solutions. I'm just going to show this one video. I don't have any anything for bears, but um, a student, Ida Bela, did use some of these gadgets. It's not from Zoo Profis, but they produce the same thing that you can use at some stage. It just turns around and sprays around the food scatter feeding, no person has to be there. And then you can see in this case, the meerkats came out and start doing it. And you can program this thing to do this 12 times a day. So scatter feeding is not necessarily something that is labor intensive. For bears, there have been these publications of system that they started in Zurich, but I think several people are using it, where you actually have frequent feeding because the bears have implanted transponders. And these feeding stations recognize the bear and the bear patrols the different feeding stations. You have several of these in the enclosure. And if there's like on a randomized time scale, the right moment, then the station will release some pelleted food for the bear. But sometimes it doesn't, it's a randomized thing, but you can actually record how much each individual is taking in. And the nice thing about this is if you give a bear a lump of food a day, it might, might more likely take everything. But if it's a time for the bear to reduce food intake, and this is the way that it gets a lot of the food, like all the pelleted, um, all the component of the pelleted diet, for example, then when it's time for the bear to reduce the intake, it might, you might recognize this much more easily. Evidently, you all know that there's lots of different enrichment ideas for bears. There's very nice, um, there's very nice documentation how you use these kind of devices, and you actually have your zoo volunteers prepare them, or you use this like you have um, school classes of children where you can prepare these devices for a whole week and then use that. There's um, tri a tribute to Graham Law, one of my big heroes in zoo animal enrichment, even though I don't like the word, the wobbly tree that he developed for the sloth bears. 
you saw already the sponsor video from Zoo Profis or others where they producing these um, boomer balls that are interesting to handle for the bears. My favorite topic when it comes to feeding carnivores is that we are still not where I think we should be go in terms of the cognitive challenge. We don't have systems where they can fail. Actually, several of you who send in diets said that during certain times you put in live fish for your bears. Actually, with live fish, sometimes this is allowed because the fish typically have an area where they can um, hide themselves from the bears. So they, you might have some real hunting opportunities. But you know, people are talking about the stereotypes that polar bears do. And on the same hand, the natural hunting style of a lot of polar bears is the absolute opposite of a movement stereotype. Even though they have all the space they want around them, they sit still sometimes for hours and because it matters. But if you're gonna feed them anyhow, why shouldn't the bear stereotype? If you feed it in a way that if it does not focus, then it will go hungry for a day and will have a next chance next day. Maybe you would change the life of these animals because they have moments during the day where what they do actually matters. It's just not playing time, enrichment time. It's a decision that they can make themselves that matters. Now, the literature on feeding bears in zoos actually has several reports that bears need to lose weight, not only in terms of the seasonal cycle, but because you have individuals that are overweight. Um, the first one that I came to my mind is that of Karen Lissy, where she did this for spectacled bears. Basically, it describes a weight loss diet for a male spectacled bear that dropped weight till it got to the target range. And this article very nicely explains the problems that you have. You have to have all this communication. Everybody has to agree that this is where you want to go. You have to detailed record keeping. You have to monitor your process all the time. And actually, the, I think, most important educative effect of such a weight loss episode is that everybody gets used to monitoring not using one recipe, but monitoring and constantly adapting to that. Um, Catherine Kerr has a publication out there, and actually this gave me the idea to make the graphs the way I showed them to, where a diet that already had some seasonal amount fluctuation in there was actually changed to a much more drastic fluctuation. This was for a brown bear in order for the bear to lose weight, and she also expressed this in these terms that the average grizzly population for which these bears would be representative would lose something like 50 kilos during hibernation. And in the beginning, before the diet changed, the zoo bears only lost very, very little, but they got them to actually having this distinct seasonal weight loss after changing the diet in this way. Um, Jennifer Watts, who also has a publication on doing these seasonal diet changes, again, for the brown bears, describes a diet that they had before the diet change. And you can see there's a heavy reliance on meat products that are always above 50%. And after the diet change, the biggest change was to actually introduce greens to a much, much higher proportion in those diets and take out the meat products that make a much lesser proportion now. And you remember these pictures that I showed that a lot of brown bear populations are actually using greens a lot, like the clover pasture that Charles also showed. And again, she showed that you, they could achieve this weight loss. And then after a while, they get into the seasonal rhythm again. Actually, Jennifer shared um, more data on the same animals with me. So you can see that from the peak where the animals were thought to be overweight, there's this weight loss, and now they are on this nice seasonal rhythm. And she describes several effects of that change, and that is the bears have lost weight, they are more active, she says, less stereotypic behaviors, and they, because of the increasing foraging behavior, they're more attractive for the, for the vis visitors, and they have these seasonal changes. And she also describes another thing that uh, relates to hibernation, and that is before the change, they were used to waking up the bears regularly during hibernation and feed them. And if they woke up, they were fed to check on them. And now they've changed to a system where they let the bears 
hibernate without disturbing them regularly so that they hibernate, so to speak, more intensively. And given the fact that nowadays we can rely on cameras, I mean, web cameras don't cost anything anymore. There's actually very little need to disturb animals that you can also monitor visually and acoustically, I think. In Zurich, we had the same situation where we had um, spectacle bears that we wanted to lose weight. And this was an interesting thing because there was some kind of group feeding element involved in there. And there's also always this question, if you have several animals together and you change the night, growing and will want you endanger that and um, this graph actually looks exactly like one Amy Plowman showed at one of the last conferences for primates where they also we also have the group feeding but once you change the diet towards something that is a little bit less attractive like from fruits to vegetables then the obese animals lose weight but the growing animals keep, still keep growing and that was actually when because of the monitoring that was introduced because of the weight loss, the monitoring continued and we were, Zurich Zoo was able to document this weight gain and loss on a seasonal basis. We had some specific questions that were sent in and one was with regard to spectacled bears, does diet contribute to the alopecia syndrome, the hair loss syndrome that looks like these pictures has diet a component in there? And the only thing I can say, the most recent publication, I liked it from Zoology from 2019, actually identified that the only statistically significant correlate with the occurrence of these alopecias was social housing. So not keeping these individuals solitarily, but keeping them with conspecifics. And if you want to find out more about the alopecia syndrome, I evidently recommend that you go for that publication. Now there's this other question that we got that I found really interesting. Does diet, the question was especially sugar, but does a diet contribute to the liver and especially the, the bile duct tumors that are seen in sloth bears? And somehow this rings a bell to what Charles said about the liver problems in polar bears, brown bears, when you, when there was a recent publication on the causes of death in sloth bears, and you can see that tumors of the bile ducts have an enormous prevalence, a huge cause of mortality in those bears. And actually, if you go through the literature, you find that all over the place, you know, even back when nature still published a section on veterinary science, I haven't seen that in a long time. In 1964, there was already reports on that. And there's a lot of reports on these tumors in sloth bears. And evidently, this might link. You can see I prepared these slides before we could get Charles on board, so I don't have to repeat this, that bears do not go for the highest possible protein levels. But as he explained, they keep those protein levels clear. One of the impressive examples of this is that you have these reports that polar bears often only eat the fat and not the muscle of the seals that they have. Now, let's say Charles' hypothesis would be right. Diets too high in protein might be related to liver problems. Well, if this was true, which species would you think most susceptible? In order to answer that question, you would have to know what the diets are that are fed to these animals and why would it be the sloth bear? So as you remember, we performed a very thorough study. We asked you to supply our diets. And so we call this our own study. Don't repeat it because it gave, gives a nice result. So we had the different species. We had, for some species, we had two zoos replying. For some, it was a little bit more. We rank them by the protein content. You can guess what is the species that has the highest protein content. Of course, that will be the polar bear. But the second highest protein content was actually found in the two sloth bear diets. So maybe for some historical reason, because people are thinking, ah, it's an anteater, so it needs meat. Maybe the sloth bear diets on average have been higher in protein than for the other bear diets. Just a hypothesis, we don't know, but the data that you send in matches that observation. 
So while Herr Janssens is getting ready to give the summary, I'm going to do the own summary for this talk. What bears have taught us and are still teaching us is bears are the prime example that if you work in a zoo with animals, you don't get one recipe and that's it. You don't ask, what should I feed to my bear? Give me one piece of paper that says it. What's the amount that I should give? but you know that there are seasonal differences. Bears would be the example species that you want multiple recipes for different months, for different season, and that you want to monitor what these differences do. Because bears are tuned to changes, not to constant conditions. So when you're thinking bears, it's not like primates that come from the tropics that don't have adaptations to enormous seasonal fluctuations. For bears, don't think fruit is bad, starch is bad, or giving no food is bad. But for bears, there's a time for everything. And that means everybody must be ready for this flexibility when you're dealing with bears. Now, we have some good news. Marco Rolla made some very nice evaluations where you have the different decades and you have the newborn or first year mortality of the bears and over the decades this is um species 360 so zims data basically for basically all species the first year mortality neonate mortality has dropped so zoos are improving and there's another way of expressing this you express the percentage of animals that reach half of the maximum lifespan don't think that anyone reaches the maximum lifespan. I mean, I know I won't live to the maximum lifespan of humans for 129 years, but if I surpass half of that, I'm going to be happy. And the proportion of animals that surpass this half of the maximum lifespan has also increased over the years. So zoos are doing something good and doing something good with bears, but now we need to go for the next challenges. That means make seasonal management a matter of course. In terms of diet, you want to think about the diet composition that you might want to change depending on season, also because it's very nice for education of telling this, and of course, the amount. So you have two different things that might change with the diet. In terms of the husbandry strategy, you want to have a constant monitoring because nothing stays the same with bears. There's constant fluctuation there. In terms of display strategies, you might want to have displays for the den because there are some periods in the year where the animals won't be visible if you don't use cameras. I think in bears you should move away from the concept of enrichment and just go to the concept your basic diet needs to be presented in a way that's cognitively challenging. Don't enrich it with something in addition. The basic diet, the diet that is up there, this has to be presented in a cognitively challenging way. And when you master that, then expand this to other animal groups. So maybe a way to engage people to say, we do this, you can say, you know, people that look after bears, they're actually pioneers. They are setting the stage for the next steps that we wanna see in zoo animal husbandry. Actually think about Yes, we can. Yes, we, we, we do change. We are change masters because, yeah, of course, we are proud bear keepers. And the final thing I want to point out when we're talking about bears, I mentioned in the beginning, if you have the word omnivore, people usually think this means anivore. You can just dump everything you want at them because they eat everything. And maybe it is best to somehow get away from this word and think of something like a bear as a diversivore using different feedstuffs at different times of year. And it's not an animal that is not specialized that you can dump anything at, but it's an animal that has a highly specialized physiology and is very special because of that. So this is my final thought. I thank you for your attention and I guess we won't have much time for live discussions now. And Anouk will soon turn over to Herd Janssens. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. Thank you all for being here and listening in to <clears throat> great time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mar Marcus. 
and at least we cannot hear everyone, but just for the energy, I'll clap my hands because I'm pretty sure everyone enjoyed this uh, a lot. Uh, very inspiring and um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I can say it, but maybe the reason why I love to be a zoo nutritionist, zoo nutritionist that much. Uh, this workshop was great. Thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, there is no time left uh, for questions or for group discussions. However, um, all the questions are um, summarized. So I will provide them to Marcus and maybe, well, he can build around his next workshop without uh, around all those questions. But for now, we need to continue. The document on the web page of the conference where I, I and talk, try to type yeah. down. Yeah, sure, we will. Yes. Um, so we need to shift to someone else, to Geert. And even though we have seen him already yesterday, I would like to give him a short introduction. Um, he is still being a professor in animal nutrition at the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine in Ghent in Belgium, Belgium. And some examples of his ongoing work are uh, digestive strategies in brown bears, yay, uh, nutrient meta metabolism in frogs. And most of us know him from his work on edible fibers in phthalates. And he also is a huge fan of combine, combining comparative nutrition with nutrient biochemistry. So how cool is that? So again, Geert, like you said yesterday, we will ask you to do the shitty job and please uh, give us a brief summary of what happened the last two days. Thank you, Anouk. Um, I would say bear with me, pun intended. Um, I will share screen because today I uh, prepared some slides, so I, I will hope this works. Um, so just uh, trying to make this work. Um, so I guess you are seeing this now. Um, so this is the end of the Zoo Nutrition Conference, uh, wrap up of the second day. Um, maybe I want to start uh, to uh, first say something to Anouk. So uh, she can turn into a ghost sometimes. So I took this picture and you see that sometimes part of her body disappear. Uh, but I want to, what I want to say is that um, when I said that making a wrap up is a shitty job, I really meant that as a nutritionist, it is so much fun. It is not shitty, it is beautiful poo. And I like to present the picture here from uh, the many presentations from Poland we had uh, about uh, the manatee. Um, but first I would like to uh, throw us back to earlier conferences uh, because it's good to see what is the history of this conference and how we are evolving. Um, so when you look at earlier conferences, uh, it is clear that in the first conferences, it was a lot about the fight for the right for fiber. Uh, and together with that, the fight against obesity and all things that were associated with, uh, um, let's say, the lack of fiber and uh, having too much sugar in the diets. Um, then we have shifted. Uh, so in the Marvel conferences two years ago, it was already clear that it was shifting away from what I could call the basic stuff. Um, and more attention was given to the small stuff. Uh, there were more talks about minerals and vitamins, uh, but it was really more of the, the pure nutrition stuff. And now I must say, uh, where are we now? Uh, first, of course, we're evidently in cyberspace, not in Vienna or something. Um, but when we talk about the content, we still see useful work being done um, about beating obesity or malnutrition, uh, but topics are widening. And I give some examples of what I picked from uh, today, but also yesterday, nutrition as part of the whole picture. So it's also more about the health of the animals. We heard a lot about the role of human behavior in the ap application of, of nutrition and how we perceive nutrition of animals. Um, also things about ethical considerations, about the sustainability of uh, the food we are giving to the animals, um, uh, preparing animals for reintroduction, and of course, coping with pandemic challenges. Um, when I look at the different species, uh, we had a nice, um, a nice range of species, mammals, birds, amphibians, reptiles, fish, and maybe something uh, on nutrition of invertebrates next time instead of invertebrates as nutrition. It might be an interesting topic. 
when we come to uh, the invited speakers, um, uh, starting with Francis this morning, at least for my morning, um, it uh, was quite interesting to learn. <clears throat> Sorry, I need a beer. Um, so it was uh, quite interesting to see um, uh, Francis talk about sustainability in zoos. Um, <clears throat> although, <clears throat> from the other hand, um, I think he, he did a very good job and it's always nice to, uh, to hear Francis talk about whatever topic is always uh, nice to listen at. Same for, uh, for Ellen, Ellen going nuts. Huh? So uh, I amused myself to, to uh, work with the print screen very often, as you will see. Um, Ellen going nuts on her talk about seats. Uh, you might think she was asleep at, uh, at that night, but no, she was uh, wide awake and she gave a good presentation about um, how seeds and, uh, and nuts, etc., can serve or not serve in a balanced nutrition of, of uh, birds and other species. Um, and then we come to Katie Amato's talk about uh, the gut microbiome. It was uh, very interesting to see all those changes that, uh, that are exerted by different factors. I remembered especially this slide where it shows that captivity and you can translate that to lockdown may affect our microbial diversity. So we must be aware that uh, sitting inside um, with this corona pandemic might also <clears throat> affect our diversity. <clears throat> and my voice is going down, sorry for that. Um, last but not least, uh, we had a very nice tandem of, of Charles Robbins and Marcus animal that could help us uh, survive a pandemic uh, because brown bears go in lockdown for several months and they don't seem to mind very much. Um, basically eating before that a lot of salmon and berries does not sound that bad and I'm very um, jealous about them on their success on losing weight um, in the in the barren season. Um, I'm not so successful in that and we can learn from uh, bears a lot I think. So this was about the talks, but I think also that uh, when we talk about the format of the of this conference, uh, there were a lot of nice things. I think we all like live conferences much more than sitting behind the screen, but I think this was a very, very nice um, uh, alternative and also with some innovation. And one of the innovations I would like to share is the innovation of the what I call the Waldorf and Stadler feature. Um, as you may have seen, uh, Ch um, uh, the uh, Marcus uh, camera was always on, and I think it was quite helpful, uh, as I call it, the MC body language support for online conferences. It will certainly have helped a lot of people to, uh, to help interpret what has been said uh, with uh, judgments of the body language of, uh, of Marcus. Um, and not only that, um, I think in general, um, and just being serious for a while, this has been a, a very nice, uh, 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 very nice symposium with lots of people and lots of input, and of course a lot of very interesting content. Also, all the different um, individuals that have the short talks and, uh, of course, were involved in the workshop. So, last but not least, I would like to uh, to give a list of the thanks um, to the keynote speakers uh, and the workshop leaders, the short talk presenters, and you, of course, the numerous, uh, numerous active participants. Uh, I would say if um, uh, Marcus calls us a kind of a family, uh, then we've been very, uh, very much reproducing. Um, I don't know whether that had to do with sitting inside with COVID, uh, but it's very nice to see that so many people were interested in this conference. Also, I'd like to um, thank the people from the European Nutrition Group um, and the people from the ASA Executive Office that helped uh, this conference uh, run smoothly. Certainly also the sponsors uh, that made this financially possible. And last but not least, of course, the organizing team uh, with Anouk, Lauren, uh, uh, Sara, Marcus, Yuka and Nicola. Uh, and I think especially when we're looking for the the most interesting vaccine uh, to help us through these hard times. Um, this uh, would be the most efficient vaccine uh, with Anouk and Laura, Lauren as, um, as uh, the driving forces of, uh, uh, of helping us out of uh, the misery, let's say, 
uh, with, uh, with this very nice uh, conference that we've had. So many thanks to them. And I think everybody can give some kind of applause now to them.